Well, let's go ahead and get started. We've got a lot to cover today. Welcome, bienvenidos to today's coffee chat on moving prevention upstream. I'm Nicole Lezen. I'm one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or CORE Investments along with Nicole Young. We're your host today and we're joined by several guests who we'll introduce shortly. Our core institute events, as you can hear, are held bilingually in English with Spanish interpretation, thanks to our team members, Stella Lauerman, who provides simultaneous interpretation and translates all of our core materials, and Gisela Carrasco, who's providing consecutive interpretation right now, and will also translate your comments and questions in the chat. I'll go ahead and provide a brief overview of core before we get into the substance of today's presentation. As many of you know, CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. It began as a results-based collective impact funding model used primarily by the county and city of Santa Cruz. In the last few years, it's evolved into more than that. So it's both a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. The evolution of CORE has been fueled by input and insights that we've gathered from many partners in local government, philanthropy, nonprofit agencies, and different community groups. This collaborative process led to the CORE mission and vision that you see here, but both of which have equity at the center. When we say equitable health and well being, we mean that all people across the lifespan have equitable opportunities to experience these eight. Inter interdependent core conditions for health and well being. That means that people's opportunities and life outcomes aren't predictable, for better or worse, by their race, ethnicity, income, gender, uh, sexual orientation, immigration status, zip code, or any other social identity they may have. So, as both a funding model and a movement, CORE provides a framework to align priorities and programs, uh, policies, funding and results around community-wide goals and for us to work together to create the core conditions for health and well-being. Equity, as we mentioned, is at the center of both the mission and vision statements and at the center of this diagram to illustrate that we have to examine and address our individual, organizational, and systemic beliefs and practices and structures because they may perpetuate the very inequities that we're determined to eliminate. And events like today's CORE Coffee Chat are offered as part of the CORE Institute for Innovation and Impact. You can think of the CORE Institute as the learning arm of CORE Investments. It offers an array of training and technical assistance and other learning opportunities like today's session for people across sectors to build the knowledge, skills, and systems that we need to fulfill our collective vision of an equitable, thriving, and resilient community. So today we're going to hear from several presenters, from Robin Luckett at the Human Services Department, Jose Flores from the Probation Department, Sarah Marshall from Sarah Marshall Strategies, and other team members who've been part of a planning effort, the Comprehensive Prevention Plans, or CPP, and you'll hear a lot more details about that in just a moment. So I'll turn this over to, um, to Sarah to to get us started with a set of more specific content. And we'll move forward from there and have some opportunities for your feedback as well. Sarah, over to you. Great, can you see my screen? I can. Okay, it looks like I'm on slide five and so I'm gonna zip back, slide one. Thank you. My name is Sarah Marshall, and it is a true privilege to be here with you all. Thank you for making time this morning. We're going to share a little bit about this important planning process. And before we do, before I jump into the detail, I'd like to just turn it over to Robin Luckett. Good morning. Clearly, technology is not my strength. So I apologize. Um, I just wanted to say good morning and very appreciative that you're all here. 
Um, we are part of a planning team of our comprehensive prevention plan for Santa Cruz County. And I think everyone's gonna introduce themselves and then we'll go into some more detail. Thank you. And Sarah, did you want me to go through and talk about CPP at this point? You know, I think we were going to introduce the planning team. Should we do that? Okay, so I can assist with that. So um, I want to introduce Jose Flores, my partner from probation. Um, also, Jose, do you want to introduce your team? Yes, good morning, everybody. Jose Flores, I'm the juvenile division director. And also with our team, uh, I'd like to introduce our, our uh, assistant division director, Jimmy Cook. Good morning. And I also would like to uh, introduce our analyst for juvenile division, uh, Sir uh, Christine. Good morning. Hi, I'm with Family and Children's Services. I want to also introduce um, Bridget Semlek, who has been working on our um, planning team as well. Bridget? Good morning, everyone. All right, well, before we, we're going to talk about this comprehensive prevention plan, share with you the process so far, um, give some opportunity for discussion and really learning from you toward the end of the presentation. So Robin, um, it'd be great if you could share why this is important to you and, and how we got started on this project. Okay, well, thank you, Sarah. Um, some of you may or may not be familiar with um, child welfare and, and probation and funding. and it's called Title IV-E, which helps support the funding for to serve children and families, whether they're in the child welfare or the probation system. And most recently, we have been given an opportunity to receive unprecedented new resource and policies um, as a way to engage not only our community, but the children and families that we serve by partnering with our public and our private partners. Um, and we're doing that with the vision that is being developed with child, family, and community well being. The opportunity has come to Santa Cruz by two federal and state actions. The first action was at the federal component of the Family First Prevention Services Act that was signed in 2018. California then opted to put into some of the policy shifts by submitting a plan to use Title IV-E funding for prevention services for those children and families at risk of foster care. This is a major change in terms of how resources have been made available to not only all states, but also to all counties. The states must submit and complete a plan to be in compliance and alignment with the federal government requirements. California has submitted this plan to the federal government, and while it is being reviewed, our state legislature legislation expanded the scope and opportunity adding targeted resources for prevention through a state block grant. And with this um, invited counties to opt into a planning process that will set up the conditions for more comprehensive prevention. Child welfare agencies with or without county probation were invited to apply. In Santa Cruz, because of a strong partnership both Family and Children's Services and probation continue to work together to submit a plan to the state and to continue to serve our children and families. This is really important to FCS. We want to work with our partners and we wanna support our community providers to assist and support children and youth upstream, meaning before they come knocking on our door, the community, is able to support family through a community supporting concept. Jose, over to you. Thank you, Robin. <clears throat> and uh, this is equally important to probation because, you know, this par partnership and uh, an opportunity uh, to serve our community and family is very important because we want to see how we can identify services for both uh, the children, youth, and families we serve. While we're two different systems, we know we serve the same youth, and we hope that we can identify services to make an impact uh, to prevent the need for our systems, for 
the, the community coming into our system. So it's an honor to be part of this process and partnering with uh, Family and Children's Services and Robin uh, to go on this journey together with the community uh, to decrease any of the trauma or negative outcomes that we've already experienced and work further upstream to really provide true and effective prevention services. Thanks, Jose. And I want to share how fortunate I feel that we um, are able to work with both Nicole Young and Sarah Marshall who are supporting us in this work and the establishment creation and implementation of a comprehensive prevention plan for our community. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Sarah and she will um, walk us through some more background about the plan and the status, where we are today and then where we're hoping to be in the future. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So this is an exciting, unprecedented opportunity for new resources, new programming, new support from our state and also uh, federal, federal government when it comes to prevention. We are talking about prevention of child abuse and also youth interacting with the systems like probation, we wanna really move upstream. And in to do that, we, we need our whole community. So you heard both Robin and Jose speak to that. Uh, we've been bringing folks together and putting together some of the pieces that are required for this plan. We're working to communicate um, two ways, really learn from the community as well as communicate what the status of the project is. And so today is one of those opportunities. We've been looking at data and really trying to understand with more depth what's happening in our community where the real opportunities are for prevention. And so again, today is another opportunity to do that. We're really looking to leverage what's already been um, what's already been uncovered in our community and then also make sure that we're really using these, these re limited resources as targeted as possible. So that really involves using data to do the work. And then from there, it's about designing, designing systems. We can look at this from a lot of different perspectives, from the program perspective, um, all the way up to policies. And those are some of the levels that we're looking at this planning opportunity. Okay. So folks referred to moving upstream and this, this analogy of the stream is one that we use in public health often where we think about the situation where people maybe have fallen into, into really rough water and, and what would happen if we all moved collectively upstream and looked at what are the conditions that, that help prevent people from falling in the stream in the first place. Um, so that's the language of upstream. I just wanted to share that with folks and we think about primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. Probably familiar terms to most folks in this room, but we'll look at those in a little bit more depth, especially with this lens of child abuse prevention. So when we think about primary prevention, this is really general activities, thinking about our entire population. How do we have the communities that really support all of us? Um, thinking about social determinants of health or in our community, those have really been well-defined through looking at core conditions. So how do we shape the core conditions for our entire community? Related to that are looking at secondary prevention opportunities where we know there are some situations that could, with support, help families. And so we think about poverty, parental substance abuse, um, parental mental health. Where can we intervene early and support families, again, from having worse outcomes or more difficult situations? And then finally, from the prevention of child abuse lens, we think about tertiary as focusing on families where there's already been child maltreatment and seeking to mitigate the trauma, helping children and families uh, recover and be in situations that are best for them. So this opportunity uh, from the state is, pr is pretty unique. Um, we're just really excited to be able to think about this, not only from that tertiary perspective, but secondary and primary. And so we've got this, again, unprecedented opportunity to think about what does prevention look like in our community and, and set up some of the conditions to to prevent child abuse in our community. Um, the Title IV e funds, so, so the federal piece is really specific to this tertiary. Uh, when we think about what the opportunity is through our state, we have more flexibility and we can think about secondary and primary prevention using our state block grant funding. So that's a little bit about how the opportunity is structured from CDSS or California Department of Social Services. 
we are thinking about this from many different perspectives. And so while we can see situations sort of at the surface, we want to go deeper in this opportunity and think about how systems are structured. How can we improve our systems? And so they're working better for people in our community. And also think about our mental models. What assumptions or beliefs do we have that are shaping the systems and conditions that we see in our community? All of this is part of our, of our planning process for the CPP. We've also uh, engaged folks in co-design. So we wanna be sure that with, within our planning meetings, uh, within our community, that we really are engaging folks authentically and that whenever we're designing something, especially for people who've interacted with the system, that they're part of that planning process. And so um, in a co-design spirit, we're thinking about how do we engage folks who have lived experience in the planning and make sure that whatever we're developing um, is, is together and in partnership and is, respectful and relevant to folks like to experience. So in terms of updates, we've been working on this plan. So I've alluded to the plan a few times. This is a document that we're creating for California Department of Social Services to be able to draw down that funding, the Title IV E funding, which is federal, and also being able to utilize the state block grants. So we're putting into place a plan, engaging our community to help us develop the plan. These are some of the pieces of that puzzle, of that plan that we're working on. And so in terms of our progress here, we've worked on governance structure, um, integrating the integrated core practice model. Um, that might be feel familiar to some folks. We're not going to talk about it in depth today, but that might be another, another opportunity for more information later. Um, engaging folks, again, across our community, and then really looking at how do we use the services that are already in place, leveraging them, and developing new programs or services to meet specific unmet needs. So some fundamental elements of the CPP we've worked on together with our community and proud to share these now, a vision of thriving children, youth, and families in a just, resilient, and connected community and a mission to co-design community-informed networks of care and build equitable, accountable, and aligned prevention services and systems. We also have a theory of change. And here in, the, in this tree visual you see in the center, healthy and supported individuals and families, and really that, that language of systems reflected throughout this theory of change. Our vision is still thriving children, youth, and families in a just, resilient, and connected community. And we know to get there, we need healthy soil, anti-racist equity-centered community, uh, equity-centered community and system norms. We need strong roots, trauma-informed, anti-racist, equity-centered system. And from there, we can put together the sturdy trunk, the sturdy branches, and the healthy leaves, the equity and well-being that we hope to see in our community. showing that briefly in Spanish. And I know that we're going through a lot of material quickly. Uh, these slides will be available for folks. I think they might already be in the chat. If not, we can share them afterwards. And hopefully folks will reach out if you have questions or ideas or concerns moving forward. So our group also thought about how do we impact change? So thinking about that, that tree diagram for this particular group how is that we're how is it that we're going to impact change and so um without reading through this i think just emphasizing that there's a group that's been formed that's the child youth and family well-being cabinet um, they're working together on this plan engaging folks in the community outside of that room and in that room to develop the plan and looking at building the strengths and assets in our community we know that shifting systems gonna take time. So really building out that governance and making sure that we've got a process to move toward results. Um, I mentioned lived expertise is essential for meaningful system change. So being thoughtful about that in the planning process, but also once we get to implementation and monitoring of this plan or project, we want lived experience to be central in that. And finally, just valuing the relational work that the care in our meeting spaces, connecting with each other is how we're actually going to make change in our community uh, when it comes to prevention. 
So the core conditions for health and well-being, um, this is really how we're thinking about social determinants of health in our community. And there's been so much work to articulate what this means in Santa Cruz County. And so you can see here, again, safe, affordable housing and shelter, health and wellness, lifelong learning and education, economic security and social mobility, thriving families, community connectedness, healthy environments, safe and just community, all of those pieces with equity centered really is what this work is about. Um, the CPP is taking kind of a, a more narrow slice and thinking about um, prevention for children, youth, and families. And yet you can see how connected it is to these social determinants and the work that we've done around core conditions as, as a community. In terms of our process, we're right here in the February, March asset mapping, really trying to understand our populations and needs. We've not quite yet gotten to design. So today is such a great opportunity to hear from you all as soon as we're in that place for discussion. Um, help us shape the design of this, this programming, this comprehensive uh, prevention plan. I also would mention that we we need to have this plan complete um, by July 30th. And so we're working on a pretty tight time, timeline to have this completed and working to do that with, with um, authentic engagement has been really important part of this. And we continue that drumbeat all the way through through July and then afterwards, once we get to implementation. I've heard Robin say that's when the work really starts. Um, so we're, we're working toward that approved plan. So just a few moments on needs and opportunities. Um, we've, we've had a lot of different opportunities to talk with folks and learn about what are some of the needs and opportunities. I'm just gonna show them at a high level because I'd like to hear from you what some of those needs and opportunities are. Um, so we had our cabinet do some mapping around the pair of ACEs. And I think some folks are familiar with this, the adverse childhood experiences being sort of at that individual level. And then we've got adverse community environments that can really exacerbate and make the adverse childhood experiences more powerfully harmful if we don't, when we have um, adverse community environments. So this is sort of the, the flip side of the tree that when we have these in place, our community and our individuals aren't as healthy as they could be. Um, we asked folks to map what some of the needs are in our community, and this was uh, right at the top. Mental health issues and substance use disorders were at the top. Um, folks talking about nowhere else to call. And so when a child or a family or a young person is, is in crisis, um, it feels like there's only like law enforcement to call or family and children services. We don't have other pathways for folks. Our group talked about there not being enough services available, and then specifically services that aren't culturally relevant or not in the right language or not in the right place. And so that's a, a, a powerful lever for us to look at. Um, post system involvement. So sometimes folks have been through a process and they're on the other side, and then there isn't the support needed to really help them from um, into, uh, coming back into a system. Certainly poverty, the social determinants of health, or again, thinking about that in the language of core conditions, those are also kind of at that root of the tree, thinking about stigma and what prevents folks from being able to access the resources that they, that they need that are already here in our community. Our group talked a lot about a lack of political power, especially for some groups. And, and so this, this issue of power being another lens that we can look at our community. And finally, um, but also very importantly, structural racism really at the root of this tree and being an area where we need to put attention to be able to change the systems uh, for the better. So this is not a thorough list of gaps, but we've also engaged our group to think about gaps and education and financial literacy being some of the gaps, um, more affordable housing and childcare. We certainly live in a very expensive community and that impacts so many families negatively. So uh, again, a gap in housing, childcare and other, and other supports. A lack of access to mental health and substance uh, use treatment. And then finally, economic and employment inequities are some of the key gaps that were identified by our, by our planning team. 
continuing a lack of understanding of how different systems and issues are connected. So this this uh, comes up so often that we've got systems or supports in place, but we don't always know how they work together or how to access them. Um, we hear that as professionals who often know a great deal about what the opportunities are in the community, still not being able to necessarily link folks to the right to the right services or supports. Again, this emphasis on racial and socioeconomic inequities. We need more culturally responsive and accepting programs and services. A lack of public transportation has also been named as a barrier for folks. A lack of father and partner involvement, support and support pro programs, and housing and affordability and instability. So this is, again, reiterating that, that issue around that core, core need for housing. When we don't have folks um, in housing situations or housing is so expensive, that's just really at the, at the root um, and an opportunity for us to make community change. So we've also talked a great deal about assets and, and opportunities, and we have in our community a great commitment to change. There's so many initiatives happening, and our students and families and communities really are, I think, at the center of many of these planning initiatives. There's been a great deal of work in Santa Cruz County on equity and anti-racism, and that work needs to continue, but the conversations have certainly started, and so that is also an asset. And we've been working to be more trauma informed, uh, also building trust with families and working at it from a strengths based perspective. We've got a number of programs in place. So I won't name all of them. These are just a few examples that were named by the planning group. And there is a spirit of collaboration and communication, even though we see that as a gap or an issue. It's also a real opportunity um, and an asset that we already have some structures in place and good relationships that help to facilitate uh, connections in our community. So in this work, opportunities, we're going to prioritize effective programs, think about direct funding and resources to families and needs, uh, families in need thinking about equity and resource distribution, educating the community and inspiring and motivating others to get involved, having difficult conversations and demanding measurable results, and thinking about a comprehensive approach to prevention. These are the opportunities in our community and we believe are ripe in this planning process. So this is the part where we want to move to some discussion and some interaction. And again, I know I went through a lot really quickly. And so I would just pause and see if folks have any questions before we start having some conversation. Anything that you need to understand clearly to be able to have a conversation about prevention. Does anyone have a question? Okay, well, we have a great group today. Oh, Jeffrey, you've got your hand up. Yes. Um, at the end of the rainbow, um, what's a round figure of the amount of funds that are available from the state? Good question. Robin, can I put you on the spot for that one? Sure. Currently, and I believe there will be additional funding coming, it's about a million dollars for both child welfare and probation combined for the state block grant. So folks that are familiar with doing planning work know that that's not a huge amount of money. Um, we do feel like it's it's a powerful amount of money, something that we can use to affect change. And I think there's another opportunity with this planning process, which is to identify what are the true needs. And there are other funding processes. There's a lot coming through the state right now. So if, if we identify needs that cannot be addressed through this plan, there might be other pathways to get them funded, especially if we've got good design and a good theory of action behind the work that we want to do. There's definitely some emphasis on evidence-based practice for this planning, and so things that are outside of that, may we may have to look for different types of funding or think about different ways of, um, of looking at them. So, Jeffrey, did that answer your question? Any other questions? So we'd like to hear from you about shifting systems and collectively moving upstream. This seems like a great opportunity to have small group conversations, um, but before we do that, we're gonna do a quick poll and ask you to rate these gaps.
So I can see some answers starting to come in. I see a question, Sarah, in the chat about, can you explain more about what is meant by education? Is that just educational opportunities in general? Yeah, so that's specific. a good question. Um, you know, I'm not sure exactly. I think I think there's education in general, education of our children, youth, and also families. Like we could really interpret that more than one way. So um, I am thinking about it from that perspective of, again, thinking about our K through 12 system, but folks might have a broader interpretation, which is fine too. It looks like the responses have slowed down. Give it maybe 10 more seconds in case anyone's still thinking and deciding what to click on. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll and then show the results so everyone can see what it looks like. I believe that the I believe if you hover your mouse over the results, you'll be able to see that the lighter blue on the left for things rated as a lower priority, the blue, brighter blue in the middle is the medium priority, and then high priority are those orange ones. So not surprisingly. 100% of all of you that answered said affordable housing, high priority, followed closely by things like mental health services and affordable child care. Thank you. Thank you for helping to prioritize that. Um, just gonna scroll down and make sure that I've seen all the results here. Yeah, affordable housing, everyone feels like, everyone that answered feels like that's a critical high priority. Thank you. So we're gonna have some more uh, conversation and invite you to help us think about uh, this prevention opportunity. The questions that we've thought about uh, for you all to consider and respond to, you know, really what does prevention look like for our county and how can we powerfully shift systems? How can we do things differently than perhaps we've done before in a way that is more effective? Um, and then thinking about your own perspective, either as an individual or your affiliation with a, with a group or a business or um, a, an organization, what is your role in prevention? And then the second piece, what are the most important opportunities for prevention from your point of view? So this helps us get to from, from the issues, what are the issues to where do we need to put attention? Where can we start really thinking about design and responding in a way that, that meets the needs of our community? So to do that, I think we're going to go into small groups. Um, Nicole, do you have any directions for folks on that? Yeah, we're gonna send you into breakouts um, and I'll post the questions in the chat so that you can see them once you get into your breakout rooms. But then also we've got a Jamboard set up so that each group, and so Sarah, I'm gonna stop your okay. screen sharing. So each group, we're inviting you to share your thoughts on the Jamboard. It'll help us have something to look back on and make sure we uh, captured everyone's thoughts about what does prevention look like in Santa Cruz? How do we shift systems? What is the role of your organization? So you'll see that each group has two slides to both share their thoughts about what prevention looks like, what are the most important opportunities, so to get to your group, you'll have to keep scrolling. And if you haven't used Jamboard before, it's pretty easy. I'll share the link in just a moment in the chat. When you get to the board, you're going to, to add a note, click on this little icon for a sticky note. You'll see that pop up and you type your note here and save it to the board. And then you can drag it around. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up all the rooms and each of you will have 
someone from the planning team in your group to help guide the discussion. And let me just make one more adjustment here before I open all the rooms. So you'll have about, I think about 12 minutes or so to um, have your discussions. We'll see you Thank soon. You So we've got um, about, let's see, I guess about 20 minutes. I don't know if we have time to do any reporting out. Nicole, what do you think? It might, it might be worth um, just hearing a couple of insights from each group just to get a sense of what the discussion was like. That would be great. Any volunteers? Well, I can. I put stuff on the jam board, by the way. I was so excited that I did it. Um, so we decided, or we suggest in, in our group that we would like to have guaranteed income for everyone in need. We would like to have consistent home visiting programs for all families without um, restrictions. We would like to have affordable childcare and then parenting classes. Um, along with not only an ACE screening, but then the ability to resource if there's an identified need after a screening that there are resources to support the family, to keep the family intact. And anybody else from my group, please add to it. I may have forgotten something critical that y'all said. I'll share my thought on the um, we, um, I'm Addie and I'm from Pajar Valley Shelter Services and we do 10 week series of ACEs um, for our participants. So it would just be nice to have these services, not just for our um, people in the shelter, but also for the community. So it would be nice to just see more of like ACEs trainings out in the community. Thanks for that, Addy. How about Jose, you wanna give us yes, a little update gonna, on your group? I was gonna touch on, thank you, Addy, for that. Um, there was one uh, a comment uh, in, um, you know, that I was noticed about how we talk about um, the, there's really no wrong door for somebody to come in and receive support, but there's always that, that uh, I guess the barrier of uh, paperwork, registration paperwork that, that needs to happen. And I think it's a systemic thing where systems don't communicate. Uh, which creates that challenge. So that was one of the things that I saw that as a barrier that if I imagine if that barrier, but there's probably all these different legalities or reasons for that. But if that were removed, that'd be something that could uh, potentially uh, um, provide more support, uh, more support for webinars of education of services, like what services are out there and available for our clients. Um, you know, that was something that, that was lifted. Um, so yeah, I have that. And anybody else from the team, if you have anything else you'd like to add, please feel free to to unmute and um, add any additional information. Great, how about um, Sarah, you wanna go next? Sure, sure. Um, so we started with some specific issues like the cost of living, the um, high cost of housing and like a lack of substance use prevention or treatment options in the county. And then we talked a little bit about, um, you know, families needing to have support early on and making sure that that issues and problems and families aren't going unnoticed. And then screening being a really helpful tool to be able to address that. Um, and so Laura from HIP talked about some of the work that they're doing related to adverse childhood experiences screening. And then also this issue that providers have noted that sometimes they, they don't want to not know where to turn or they don't want to um, not be able to refer people properly. So we need good referral systems, but then we also need the services that work on the other side where we know that that person got connected, they got the support that they needed. So a little bit about our systems um, and also the importance of like community providers and that making sure that uh, 
folks don't go too long without getting assistance. And so uh, Kristen was talking about uh, community groups that can just help refer folks to assistance and support. And if they know how to do that, um, people can get the support they need. And that's really a, a real opportunity for us as a community. Anything else, group? Hey, how about Nicole, you wanna close us out with the uh, report outs? Sure, and I'll encourage Prima, Vicki, Jeffrey and Bridget to chime in as well. But we had some really similar themes to what's been expressed already in terms of um, strengthening referrals earlier um, before the frustration with people only getting to services at the point where they've already reached some crisis. Um, so what, what are ways to make um, services more accessible in the community and not just through agencies? And Bridget, I think you had the, the statement about um, in shifting systems by shifting people away from systems um, so that it wasn't just an, a, a particular agency door that people walk through um, to get services and support and have that more broadly available. So a lot of the same kinds of things, strengthen referrals, um, get get help out earlier and reduce barriers to help and support. Anything to add, group four? I would only add, I mean, we were getting to that point of the conversation. It was a really robust and interesting conversation in our group, but the idea of looking at things that are out there already that are working well, um, our group I think everyone is pretty familiar with the Families Together program and talking about what are the aspects of that particular service delivery that are really effective. And we talked about, you know, um, eliminating all of those barriers and obstacles for families, like allowing services to come into the home as opposed to parents having to go to three or four different agencies to get, you know, parenting support, maybe there's some counseling, um, all those things and looking at what we have already that works well. Um, and then recognizing that the community door, the self-referral path doesn't exist in the way that it needs to with a program like that. So really expanding that where people can self-refer without the stigma of being involved in a system and access those services on their own. It sounds like in a short amount of time, you all had some really uh, good, thoughtful discussions and always nice to see when there's some themes that emerge across groups too, it gives us a sense of where there's some energy and urgency to keep working on these things. So Sarah, yeah, you wanna take it from here? Yeah, and again, just thanking everyone for your time in the small groups, that piece about referral and systems is just so helpful to hear from you all as, as people doing the work in the community. And I think that's absolutely something we can focus on and ensure there's a pathway for in this plan. So in terms of continuing our outreach, um, we want to, again, have this comprehensive prevention plan really represent our, our full county. And so there might be, you know, materials or documents that you think that we should be looking at. Maybe you've got a plan, your organization has a plan around prevention, or it's a plan that speaks to prevention, or maybe some data that might be useful for us to include in the needs assessment. Um, an invitation to share anything with Nicole or I that you think might be helpful. Um, you can email it, or that's probably the best, or just reach out, we can find another way. Um, and then we're also going to be asking folks in the community about services or supports that have been the most helpful, um, what's made a difference for you, and what should community organizations or county agencies do better. So again, I think many of you, or if you're working with an organization, you might already be collecting some of this information. And if you've got that information that you'd like to share back with us, just helping to bolster that community voice and that community participation, um, that would be wonderful wonderful for us to receive and again in, integrate into this planning process. Um, there is a survey that is really important. I don't know how I skipped over it, but it's in the chat. So I'm going to just send it now. 
Um, the piece about asset mapping uh, and really building on our strengths uh, is important. And I alluded to before in this planning process, there is a lot of emphasis from the federal and also CDSS on evidence-based and well-supported practices. So in this survey, what you'll see is a lot of questions around evidence-based practice, um, but there's also other questions as well and some around like how we do referrals, uh, what are the systems in place for referrals. And so if we can have a, re a robust response to the survey, I think we can have a really great um, asset map to share back with you all. And we can see where, wow, look at these bright spots that we have. And wow, look at these opportunities to work better together. So again, really would appreciate folks taking the time. It takes about um, 15 minutes to answer this survey. And it takes someone who has some knowledge of the, you know, the programming and even some of the funding. So just appreciate your time. We will in incentivize that. I don't think I announced it in this survey, but we'll we'll do a drawing for at least one, one cash prize winner um, in, in answering the survey for your organization and would appreciate you sharing this with your teams, um, with other organizations that you think might have some prevention services or services that might be important for us to consider as we're looking at our community and our and our assets in place. So again, just the invitations to answer the survey, share the survey, let us know if you feel like there's information we should be looking at to better understand the community and build that into this planning process. And I think a commitment for us to come back uh, and, and share progress as we've got a more full plan and sort of test it back with you all. That would be up to, I think, Nicole and Nicole to make sure it fits in with the core coffee chat timeline. But we'd love to be able to come back at some point and again, share sort of where, where we've gone um, after some more input and inquiry and getting pen to paper and make sure that it fits with what you feel like are the most important needs for our community. So with that, I think that covers everything that I have. And so I'm going to send it back to Nicole Lezen here. Thank you, Sarah. I'm hoping everyone can see our upcoming events. Um, we've got a lineup for the rest of this month and into March and April with um, next week on Tuesday morning at the same time at 10 o'clock, but ending at 11 instead of 11.15. We'll hear um, from Keisha Browder and Dan Chavez about combining the 211 helpline with the um, health information resources from Santa Cruz Health Information Organization, FIO. Um, and that will be a core coffee chat format similar to today's where we'll have some um, opportunities for questions from them and hearing a presentation from them. Then on Tuesday, March 7th, the, a longer format like today's from 10 to 11.15. It's a series that we're, we've been doing with DataShare Santa Cruz County to explore some of the data behind each of the core conditions, each of the eight core conditions. And this one, um, I'm sorry, that will be the, the April 18th one. This one on March 7th will be about uh, single use tobacco products and some of the environmental health issues associated with those. And that will be co-sponsored with the City of Santa Cruz's Health and All Policies group. So that'll be an opportunity to learn about some of that broader work and a specific um, issue with, with tobacco products. But the April 18th one will be the one that's exploring the core conditions and this time for a safe, just community and all the data associated with that core condition. That is in uh, collaboration with DataShare Santa Cruz County. It's part of a series that we've been doing to explore each of the core conditions. And it, that's an, a longer format as well from 10 to 11.15. We will have an opportunity in those as well to have some smaller uh, breakout discussions like we had today and we hope that you'll join all of these, but um, stay tuned for more. We always have opportunities to add to these uh, sessions throughout the spring, and we look forward to seeing you at an upcoming core event. We also really want to hear from you about what today's session was like. We pay close attention to your feedback, and we hope that you will take the time to answer the feedback poll that Nicole is placing um, right now before you 
go on with your day. So thanks for being with us. Any last thoughts from our presenters or any questions to ask the group? Also like to thank Stella and Gisela for the interpretation and translation. Um, so, so amazing to see the, the work that you do in real time as well as before and after these sessions. So thank you both. And Nicole, I just wanna say a couple last things. One is, um, I realized that the link to the registration for next week's coffee chat for the 28th, um, it was wrong on the slide, so I oh. just updated it. Um, and then um, I also got a message, a private message from someone asking if, if there are individuals who have that lived experience of trying to access or navigate services, and if they're interested in providing feedback, could we do one-on-ones or, and so that's a yes. So if anybody else, you know, in addition to other reports or other data that you might have, if, if there are um, children, youth, parents that you think um, have a perspective that would be good for us to be hearing about or learning about as part of this process, please let us know. So thank you, everyone. I put my also my email in the chat um, in case you are one of those folks who has either information to share. Or maybe you want to have a one on one conversation with Nicole or I to help us improve the plan. Feel free to reach out and we will make that connection. I appreciate everyone's time and your assistance today. Thanks, everyone.